Chapter Seven of Kabumpo in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Seven. Sir Hocus and the Giants. Oh! Sighed Sir Hocus of Pokes and Oz stretching his armoured legs to the fire how i yearn to slay a giant how it would refresh me hast any real giants in oz dorothy don't you remember the candy giant laughed the little girl looking up from the handkerchief she was making for ozma not to my taste said the knight though his vest buttons were vastly nourishing well there's mr yu he's a real blood and bone giant there are plenty of giants i guess if we knew just where to find them said the little girl biting off her thread find em bind em get behind em hocus pocus he don't mind em screamed the patchwork girl bounding out of her chair but why can't you stay peaceably at home old ironsides and be jolly like the rest of us you don't understand scraps put in dorothy gravely sir hocus is a knight and it is a true knight's duty to slay giants and dragons and go on quests that it is my lady patches boomed sir hocus puffing out his chest i've rusted here in idleness long enough to-morrow with ozma's permission i shall start on a giant quest i'd go with you only i promised to help ozma count the royal emeralds said the scarecrow who had ridden over from his corn ear residence to spend a week with his old friends in the emerald city giants sir are bluff and rude and might mistake a man for food hocus pocus be discreet or you will soon be giant meat chuckled the patchwork girl crooking her finger under the knight's nose nonsense blustered sir hocus waving scraps aside rising from his green armchair he strode up and down the room, his armor clanking at every step. Straightway the company began to tell about wild giants they had read of or known. Trot and Betsy Bobbin held hands as they sat together on the sofa, and Toto, Dorothy's small dog, crept closer to his little mistress, the bristles on his back rising higher as each story was finished. Giant stories are all very well, but why tell them at night shivered toto peering nervously at the long shadows in the corners of the room it was the evening after ruggedo's strange discovery of the mixed magic and in the royal palace ozma and most of the courtiers had retired but a few of princess dorothy's special friends had gathered in the cosy sitting-room of her apartment to talk about old times they were very unusual and interesting friends not at all the sort one would expect to find in a royal palace even in fairyland dorothy herself before she had become a princess of oz had been a little girl from kansas but after several visits to this delightful country she had preferred to make oz her home trot and betsy bobbin also had come from the united states by way of shipwrecks so to speak and had been invited to remain by ozma the little fairy princess who ruled oz and now each of these girls had a cosy little apartment in the royal palace toto had come with dorothy but the rest of the company were of more or less magic extraction the scarecrow a stuffed straw person with a marvellous set of mixed brains given to him by the wizard of oz was dorothy's favourite in fact she had discovered him herself upon a munchkin farm lifted him down from his bean-pole and brought him to the emerald city tick-tock was a wonderful man made entirely of copper who could talk think and act as well as the next fellow when properly wound you would have been amazed to hear the giant story he was ticking off at this very minute as for scraps she had been made by a magician's wife out of old pieces of patchwork and magically brought to life her bright patches yarn hair and silver suspender button eyes gave scraps so comical an expression that just to look at her tickled one's funny bone 
Her head was full of nonsense rhymes, and she was so amusing and cheerful that Ozma insisted upon her living with the rest of the celebrities in the Emerald City. Sir Hocus of Pokes was a comparative newcomer in the capital city of Oz. Yet the night was so old that it would give me lumbago just to try to count up his birthdays. He dated back to King Arthur, in fact, and had been wished into the land of Oz centuries before by an enemy sorcerer. Dorothy had found and rescued him, with the cowardly lion's help, from Pokes, the dullest kingdom of Oz. As there were no other knights in the Emerald City, Sir Hocus was much stared at and admired. Even the soldier with the green whiskers, the one and only soldier and entire army of Oz, yes, even the soldier with the green whiskers saluted Sir Hocus when he passed. Ozma herself felt more secure since the knight had come to live at the palace. He was well versed in adventure and always courageous and courteous withal. But while I've been telling you all this, Tick-Tock had finished his story of a three-legged giant who lived in Ev. And where is Ev? puffed Sir Hocus, planting himself before Tick-Tock. Ev? began Tick-Tock in his precise fashion, is to the northwest of here, on the other side of the im... There was a whir and a click, and the copper man stood motionless and soundless, his round eyes fixed solemnly on the night. Passable desert, finished the scarecrow, jumping up and kindly winding all of Tick-Tock's keys as if nothing had happened. Passable desert, continued the copper man. That's where the old gnome king used to live, piped Betsy Bobbin, bouncing up and down upon the sofa, under the mountains of Ev, and he threw us down a tube and tried to melt you in a crucible, didn't he, Tick-Tock? He was a very bad person, said the copper man. Regido was a wicked king, though now he's good as pie, but none the less, I must confess, he has a wicked eye, burst out Scraps, who was tired of sitting still listening to giant stories. But Sir Hocus could not be got off the subject of giants. To Ev, thundered the knight, raising his sword. Tomorrow I'm off to Ev to conquer this terrible monster. Large as a mountain, you say, Tick-Tock? Well, what care I for mountains? I, Sir Hocus of Pokes, will slay him. Hooray for the giant killer, giggled Scraps, turning a somersault and nearly falling in the fire. Let's go to bed, said Dorothy uneasily. She had for the last few minutes been hearing strange rumbles. Of course, it could not be giants. Still, the conversation, she concluded, had better be finished by sunlight. But it never was, for at that moment there was a deafening crash. The lights went out. The whole castle shivered. Furniture fell every which way. Down clattered Sir Hocus, falling with a terrible clangor on top of the copper man. Down rolled the little girls and the scarecrow and scraps. Down tumbled everybody. Cyclone! gasped Dorothy, who had experienced several in Kansas. Giants! stuttered Betsy Bobbin, clutching Trot. The Wizard of Oz tried to reassure the agitated company. He told them there was no cause for alarm, and that they would soon find out what was the trouble. The soothing words of the wizard were scarcely heard. What the others said was lost in the noise that followed. Thumps, bangs, rashes, screams came from every room in the rocking palace. We're flying! The whole castle's flying up in the air! screamed Dorothy. Then she subsided as an emerald clock and three pictures came thumping down on her head. What had happened? No one could say. Dorothy, Betsy, Bobbin, and Trot had fainted dead away. The Scarecrow and Sir Hocus were tangled up on the floor, clasped in each other's arms. The confusion was terrific. Only the wizard was still calm and smiling. End of chapter 7